Okay, let me welcome you to this lecture 10 of our course on reinforcement learning at ASU. Today, uh, we do transition from uh, online play ideas that we have been covering so far to offline training algorithms, um, including the use of neural networks and other parametric architectures. We're going to do a couple of lectures on offline training. Here's the outline. We're going to, to do a little review of what we have done so far and where we're going and what uh, we're going to not cover, leave out. Then we're going to go into offline training and the use of parametric approximation architectures. We will discuss training algorithms for these architectures to find the parameters of these architectures. And then we're going to discuss the more general issue of uh, these uh, uh, algorithms as a, as, a, a, as a special case of a broader class of algorithms that use for optimization of sums, large sums of differentiable functions. Then we're going to say a few things about neural networks and how these algorithms apply to their context. So let's uh, go into a review. Okay, so this is a familiar figure and our starting point, uh, the alpha zero architecture and also the MPC architecture that are very similar. And uh, they involve a fundamental division between online play and offline training. And the online play algorithm is what you see here in blue. And uh, uh, it involves, uh, at the current state, uh, multi-step look ahead uh, and generation of a search tree. And then we run a policy for a number of steps. And then at the end, we approximate the effect of additional steps using a terminal cost function approximation. Now, what you see here in red is where offline training comes into play. Offline training is used to provide the terminal cost approximation and also the policy by which you do rollout. And this is done before you start the decision-making process. It's all the preliminary phase, separate from the online play. And the algorithms that you use for online play and offline training can also be designed separately and, uh, and uh, in almost independently. And the two interact together through a fundamental relation that has to do with Newton's method. Newton's method is this first step of the look ahead minimization. And uh, these other steps here represent enhancement of the cost approximation uh, through some forms of value iteration, so that to bring, to provide a better starting point for the Newton step. The first step is an exact minimization and does all the work. The remainder is important, but it's not as important as the very first step. And uh, bear in mind also that uh, in this figure, uh, you may not have multi-step look ahead, perhaps only one step look ahead. You may not have a middle portion. Different designs uh, uh, involve different uses of these ideas. What I have here is the more general. Um, the, the most general uh, figure. And uh, to me, this is fundamental for reinforcement learning. Uh, it is possible to get good policies through reinforcement learning without online play. For example, you can get a, a base policy through some kind of a approximation policy space, a kind of a policy network and use it directly without going through this multi-step look ahead minimization. But there is a loss in performance. There's a cost improvement property that we have discussed between the base policy and the online play policy. This is much better. In some cases, it, it is tremendously better, like in alpha zero. In other cases, the improvement is not so substantial. So you may get better 
you may get good performance out of the date policy. However, the best through this scheme here. Now we have covered the online play, um, the online play uh, algorithm design. And um, what we have done is uh, we started with four lectures, overview, big picture type of lectures that are covered in chapter one of your notes, the division between all offline training and online play, where Newton's step comes in, what it does for us. We discussed exact dynamic programming for deterministic problems and for stochastic problems, for finite horizon problems and infinite horizon problems. We did this in not very much theoretical detail, just to get you started and to, 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 to set the stage for what comes, uh, uh, for what, what were to, was to come later. Then in this introductory lectures, we place some emphasis on rollout and approximation in value space. We viewed rollout as, as part of policy duration, the very first step of policy duration. We discussed the problem formulations and transformations. Uh, how do you formulate problems? The basic idea is uh, you need to start from a, from a sequence of decisions. That's, uh, such, such, that, that, that set the stage for a dynamic system and the sequential uh, choices of controls. Then if the problem does not quite fit the standard form that we have, uh, that we have been using, you may change it to, by introducing state augmentations, may change by introducing a termination state, for example, stochastic or this path problems. Um, Multi-agent problems admit a transformation that's very interesting for our purposes. Uh, and they involve multi-component controls. And uh, these cause computational difficulties. We reformulate the problem so that uh, this difficulty does not arise to nearly as much extent. We discussed the transformations of partial state information problems to perfect state information problems by using the idea of a belief state, sufficient statistic. We talked uh, about adaptive control and model predictive control, not in great detail. And unfortunately, throughout the course, we're not going to cover this material very much. However, next year, I plan to, to focus the course on adaptive and model predictive control. The subject is too large, so we can't cover everything in one semester. Okay, so after this overview lectures, we went in some detail on online play algorithms. in chapter two of your class now. Um, we started out with rollout algorithms for deterministic and stochastic problems and various variations, fortified rollout, simplified rollout, constrained rollout, model-free rollout for deterministic problems. And for stochastic problems, we touched upon variance reduction ideas that have to do with efficiency in the sample. Then we focused on multi-step look ahead. We did a lecture, multi-step look ahead for deterministic problems. Ideas of pruning, double rollout, incremental rollout, and so on. Then we look at multi step look ahead for stochastic problems. The idea of certainty equivalence approximation approximate the random variables of all stages except the first one with a deterministic equivalent. That speeds up the, the, the computations tremendously. And uh, at a relatively small loss of performance, if any. We talked about Monte Carlo research, a form of adaptive simulation that aims to, uh, to make the, the computation of the various expected values, various parts of the online play algorithm make it more efficient. We reviewed in uh, two lectures ago, multi-agent problems, and there was a demo. Um, there are some variations that we haven't covered in great detail, particularly the idea of autonomous agents that communicate with each other indirectly through signaling and uh, 
uh, and coordinate their actions. All of this is in your notes, but we didn't cover it in as much detail as I would have liked. In the last lecture, we talked about Bayesian optimization, sequential estimation, adaptive control, a FOM DP framework, a more principal framework for adaptive control. And also, we talked about the use of rollout in that context, and we did this, this case study using Word. So that's what we have done so far. And um, here's where we're going. Um, we're going to do two more lectures um, today and next week. And uh, they're going to be based on the material of chapter three of your class notes. And uh, we will cover approximation of values and policies using uh, values and cost function approximations and policy approximation using neural networks and other architectures. The training of this approximation architecture is using incremental gradient methods. This is what we're going to do today. Next uh, week, we're going, to, we're going to discuss approximate value and policy iteration algorithms uh, with approximation architectures. For policy iteration, you have to use approximation architectures. With rollout, you don't need to use neural networks or approximation architectures. But when you try to do policy iteration, it's it, you cannot you cannot get away from using neural networks or something similar. Then we're going to talk about an alternative approximation architecture based on aggregation. We're going to do these two things in our last lecture that's next week. Okay, there's a lot that has been left out. And uh, if you go back and you look at the my video lectures from the course offerings of uh, 2019 to 2021, also the, nine, the reinforcement learning book of 2019, and also my two volume dynamic programming book, there are several additional topics. There's a lot more on the theory of infinite horizon programs. The theory of infinite horizon programs is fairly intricate. It's not like finite horizon dynamic programming, which mathematically speaking is almost trivial. Uh, it's very intuitive and, uh, and very simple. And you go to infinite horizon problems, this mathematical theory that's substantial, uh, particularly if you get away from discounted finite state problems, which is the bulk of the work in reinforcement learning from the artificial intelligence community is on finite state discounted problems. These problems are relatively easy. But once you step away from those, substantial mathematical difficulties arise, which we have not covered in this course, but there's a fairly good outline here and a very extensive treatment in here. And also in the early course video lectures. Um, there are some training methods uh, for stochastic problems that are related to stochastic iterative algorithms, and they are used in approximation in value space. It's a famous method called TD lambda and other temporal difference methods. There's a lot of literature on those. They were very important in the early part of the subject. Now I'm not so sure that they are as, as important, but they were very important in the 90s. And they were also, they attracted a lot of mathematicians because they're very challenging. They have involved challenging analysis, algorithmic analysis, which uh, sort of uh, um, got mathematicians interested in that. Q learning um, is, uh, uh, there's also interesting mathematical analysis of Q learning. Uh, the first one actually is my co-author, uh, John Zeklitz. Um, and uh, all of this, uh, all of this, we did not cover. There's some of that in this book, more in here, and also in the references given right there. Um, finally, there's a fairly popular topic in uh, quite a few groups in artificial intelligence uh, uh, type of reinforcement learning, involving approximation in policy space and policy gradient methods. Policy gradient methods and also random search methods are used to train policies. 
In our context, they could be used to provide a base policy for rollout or for approximation value space, but they also could be used by themselves as standalone policies. They are not as good as the ones that you get in multi-step look ahead because there's no cost improvement. On the other hand, they may be good enough to be used in a particular context. And the nice thing about approximation policy space outside of, uh, of approximation in value space is that once you have a policy that has been trained, finding, generating controls online is almost instant, instantaneous. You don't need to do this multi-step look ahead minimization, roll out all this business, which can be quite time consuming. However, there's a loss in performance in doing that, a convenience in the online computation, but a loss of online performance. Okay, we're not gonna do this stuff. There's plenty of literature, some my own, and certainly a lot of literature in, out there. And uh, all of these are topics that many people in the field are working on actively, and, uh, and uh, they're important topics. However, we cannot cover everything, so we have to draw the line somewhere. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, so now let me recall a figure that we have used in the past for approximation in value space with one step look ahead. Uh, at a given state, xk, this is for finite horizon, similar figure for infinite horizon, at a given state, xk, we find a control by minimization of the expected cost of the first step and the expected approximate cost for the future as encoded by a cost function approximation, j tilde k plus one instead of j star k plus one. And remember there are three approximations here. The three approximations, it is an approximation of the optimal cost to go function. There's an approximation of this expected value calculation that can be very substantial. And there's an approximation of this minimization, which can also be uh, quite time consuming. And there are a number of methods that we have, uh, we have uh, discussed um, for computing J tilde, problem approximation, rollout, model predictive control. Today, we're going to talk about this pink stuff here. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about aggregation among others. For approximating the expected value, we have discussed the use of certainty equivalence, adaptive simulation, Monte Carlo free search, and uh, a special case of approximate minimization, which however has solid guarantees is multi-agent minimization. It's a simpler minimization, but it doesn't lose much if anything in performance. So this is for one step look ahead. There's a similar picture for multi-step look ahead, except for some special issues that arise in the context of, uh, of, uh, of multi-step. Instead of looking only one step ahead, we use L steps ahead and then approximate the future of the sun chain tilde. Again, there is issues of similar issues of both approximation. Um, there is issues of, of approximating the expectation by using certainty equivalence after the first step. That's an important, uh, an important, um, an important idea. Um, and then there's a dynamic programming minimization of all this thing. This is an L-step dynamic programming problem. The original problem may have been a very long horizon problem, but this is only L-steps ahead. We minimize here with whatever approximations we have. We solve this by some form of dynamic programming, some sort of, uh, of perhaps involving approximations like we have discussed. And then we throw away all the policies after the first step and use only the first control. And the idea of multi-step look ahead is that it enhances, the key idea is that it enhances the starting point of the Newton step and brings it closer to the sweet spot of Newton's method that gives you very good performance. In practice, multi-step look ahead nearly always works better than one step look ahead but the computational requirements are more substantial 
and uh, and uh, that's the basic trade-off. So now we're going to go into this pink stuff, parametric approximation architectures for offline training. Okay, the reinforcement learning, there are two types of approximations. Machine learning, of course, a much bigger subject than reinforcement learning. All sorts of approximations, machine learning, but in reinforcement learning, there are only two things that you want to approximate, cost functions and policies. So the first type of approximation is cost approximation in finite and infinite horizon problems. In other words, approximate the optimal cost functions of the finite horizon problem or the optimal cost function, the infinite horizon problem or the optimal Q functions for finite and infinite horizon problems. Note here that the, for infinite horizon problems, there's only one function that you want to approximate. But in finite horizon problems, it's a, whole, it's a whole bunch of them, okay? So presumably there's a lot more work for that, but still you can use uh, approximations even in that context. Um, and uh, that's why in finite horizon problems rollout is usually better than, uh, than approximations uh, uh, because there's less work, there's more work to do in approximations over infinite horizon. Just as we can approximate the optimal cost functions, we can also, we may also be interested in approximating the cost function of policies, a finite horizon policy or an infinite horizon policy or the Q function of a policy, finite horizon, or an infinite horizon policy. So that's one type of approximation, cost approximation. The second type of approximation is policy approximation approximate an optimal policy in finite or infinite horizon settings or approximate a given policy. Uh, and, uh, and we are going to, approximation can be done in many different ways, uh, heuristically, single the pants, whatever, but we are going to focus on parametric approximations, whereby we introduce parametric classes of functions depending on a parameter vector r, either in the cost approximation or in the policy approximation. And then we choose r based on training. And uh, now this parameter here is going to be specific to particular types of architectures. For example, in neural networks, R is a huge vector that's the set of all weights of the neural network. I presume that all of you have been exposed to some extent neural networks. You know what I'm talking about weights, and we're going to discuss weights shortly. So that's what we're looking at, parametric approximations involving a parameter vector R. And uh, let me give you a schematic for cost approximation and then uh, policy approximation. Okay, in cost approximation, we have a target cost function, which is J. We may have multiple tar target cost functions, but we do them one at one, one by, by a time. We generate training data. Training data is pairs of states and corresponding costs, perhaps involving some approximation, but I'm omitting that here. So I generate Q training pairs. Q may be in the hundreds or in the millions, okay? Could be very large. And uh, it's done in some problem specific fashion. We have all this training data, and then we pass it through an approximation architecture and we massage this parameter through some algorithm so that the output, the approximating function, matches the input. In other words, what this approximating function does when specialized to these states gives you similar output as this J. This is done by some kind of regression, these squares and so on. Specialized optimization software, uh, gradient type methods that I'm going to discuss, and also other types of least squares methods. 
So we have a target and we want to match an approximation to the target by using training. Yes. Um, how do you get the target cost function? Like, yeah, like say like for a trajectory, it will be quite expensive, no? Like because we did all that um um what's that? Uh, like because we need the full computation, exponential computation to get the exact cost function, and then like how, how do we get that for trajectories? No, you run trajectories, yes. Uh, at least in the methods that I'm going, I'm discussing. You run trajectories. I don't know what you mean by exponential computation. You know, I run by um, two trajectories. And if the problem is stochastic, you run more, okay? Okay. Um, but like, I mean, my question is just like, how to get the, so I just run several trajectory or like um, doing like simulation-based method and then ju just get an approximate of uh, the actual um, expected uh, value of that state. Yeah, by bunching together a lot of simulation trajectories, if you do Monte Carlo simulation, the problem is stochastic, then you get, uh, you get a richer training set. In principle, this J may, may consist of noise, but in the methods that we are discussing, the noise is going to be averaged uh, by natural or naturally within the other. So that J is, uh, the gold J is an uh, approximation of uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, uh, tilde J is, okay. Not tilde J, um, the gold J. This J, in it this could be a sample, okay, okay. of a stochastic trajectory. Sure. And, uh, um, now, all of this is it was a lot of work, both the collection of the data and also the training. But all of this is offline. So you can sit there for weeks, okay, collecting the data or even more. And if you have parallel, parallel computing hardware, then you can have them, you can put them into advantage, you can put them to, to use with advantage. So that's the picture for, for cost functions. This may be a finite horizon cost function or infinite horizon cost function, cost function of policy, whatever. Now let's uh, talk about policy approximations now. Now, if the control has continuous components, then the training is pretty similar to the cost function case. You generate training data, you pass it through uh, an approximation architecture, you do regression, u squares, whatever, and you get uh, a parametric representation of uh, a pro parametric approximation of the target policy. Now, in many problems, the control set is finite, okay? There are only a finite number of controls. And this brings to bear an alternative approach that's, uh, that's commonly used. It's based on classification. Um, if you've been exposed to machine learning at all, you've heard about the classification problem. You want to build a classifier, and what the classifier does is it, uh, it for given samples from a certain population, it classifies the samples to a certain category. So let's say the population is fruit, okay, a gigantic population of fruit. You put them through a classifier, looks at each one case and the classifier says, this is an orange, it's an apple, this is an apricot, okay, pear, whatever. So it's a, there, there's a lot of software associated with classification that is, um, there is, uh, uh, that, that, that's available to you and a lot of experience in, using, in constructing and using classifiers. So, a policy turns out to be a classifier. You can view it as a classifier. So what's the classification? It looks at the population of states and classifies them into the categories of the subsets of states that correspond to the different controls. M categories, and each category, the first category is the set, is, is a set of states for which you require control in one. The second, category, the ones that require control you to, and so on. So the classifier makes a partition of the state space 
And each part of the partition is a set of states that you use the corresponding control according to this policy. So a policy for the case of a finite number of controls is a classifier. And uh, you can train it with classification software. Now, some classifiers introduce randomized policies. Instead of generating controls at the output, they generate control probabilities. That's common in classifiers. Not all classifiers, but, but many of them. So here's the stick schematic. You have a target policy that you want to approximate. You generate training data for Q samples of states. You, you generate the corresponding control. And then you build a classifier which assigns state X to control for class U. It's a parametric classifier, depends on the parameter and outputs control probabilities. So for a given state and for a given parameter, this is the probability that at state X, you apply control one and so on. That probability that at state X, you apply control M. These probabilities have the meaning of quality of control. High probability controls are higher quality controls that you prefer. And if you are interested in just outputting just a single control, then you do a max operation here and output the control of maximum probability. For example, alpha zero uh, at the output generates probabilities of various moves. Okay, this move is 90% good. This other move is 3% good. This other move is 5% good. And uh, so it provides a more flexible evaluation of moves. And it turns out that alpha zero, these probabilities are used to to drive the Monte Carlo research. It's a complicated story, but it gives you the idea. Also, if you look at chess programs, uh, okay, if you look at the, they, they output at a given position, uh, something that looks like probabilities, the strongest move, the second strongest move, and so on. So it's common to use uh, randomized policies and classifiers that output probabilities, and um, the training now, matching these probabilities to the data can be done with various classification software, often involving optimization, often involving similar things as what costs. And, uh, and one of the, okay, random bikes, policies, the randomized policies are also helpful because they have continuous components. And uh, for some algorithms, continuous components, they're more friendly to them. So what I want to impress you here is that policy approximation, parametric architectures is pretty similar to cost approximation, except that in the case of finite control space, you have more options. You have an option to use classification software. Okay, so now we'll focus on cost function approximation and uh, not so much uh, focus on, uh, on policy approximation. We start with a target function and also we start with a class of parametric, a parametric class of functions that depends on X and also on a vector of tunable parameters. This is a vector of M parameters. M can be very large or can be relatively small but it's a vector and uh, we aim to adjust this vector in order to change J tilde and match the training data from the target function. And the training algorithm is simply the optimization algorithm that chooses R. It's a regression type of nonlinear regression type of algorithm, both squares, linear regression. Okay, usually it's involves quadratic uh, penalties, but there are also other possibilities. Um, this J tilde here depends on X in a complicated way, but it may be linear in R or it may be nonlinear. If uh, it's the difference is linear, we call the architecture linear. Otherwise we call it nonlinear. Uh, 
neural networks are decidedly nonlinear and very complicated. Now, an important class of approximation architects that use features that are feature based and they depend on X via a feature vector. This is a vector, and this is a vector of, uh, that captures major characteristics of X. So mathematically, the architecture depends on X, but through this feature vector. And the idea here is that these features capture dominant nonlinearities. So even though the dependence is more restricted here on X, it's still good enough because phi is well chosen to represent the adequate nonlinearities in J tilde. Okay, so uh, what is a linear feature based architecture? It is one that depends linearly on the parameters and also on the feature vector. The feature vector here in this equation consists of m components. Okay, there are m given x, the feature vector is m numbers, and they correspond to the value of the corresponding feature. <laughs> And uh, what you see here is the inner product of the number of the parameter vector and the feature vector. Now, the words the sum of the products of these two. And, uh, and uh, RL are the components of R, and PL are the components of P. And a linear feature based architecture, you can see a picture here, have a state. Out of this, we extract the features to obtain this feature vector. We weigh the, fit, the features with linear with parameters linearly, and we get at the output the linear cost approximate. This in a product here. And, uh, and in training, we try to find this R that uh, sort of matches the training set that you have um, uh, from the from the matches the training set. Okay, so now let me give some examples of uh, features and feature based architectures. This is a very generic example. Uh, piecewise constant approximation. You have some target function that I'm not showing. You want to approximate with a piecewise constant function, a function that is constant within some subsets. Now, you have a partition of the space into subsets. S1 up to Sm, and you specify your approximation architecture to um, so that the, the, the approximation is constant in each, uh, in, each, uh, uh, in each subset. So what is the feature? The fe what are the features here? Um, they specify membership in the corresponding sets. So Vl is equal to one, if X belongs to the corresponding set as L, and zero otherwise. So in other words, given a state, this feature tells you that X lies on the right side or in the left side or in the middle. Okay, this is the kind of, uh, kind of information that these features provide. And now if you take these, these functions that have like height one, you multiply them with R, you obtain an architecture of this form here. There are these constant levels, and the levels are the parameters of the architecture. And the architecture is piecewise constant with value RL for all X within the corresponding set. It's a very general architecture, not very powerful though, because if you have a complicated target function, you have to select very judiciously this sense here before you can have something that's effective. Here's another very general architecture, a polynomial approximation. Okay, suppose that the state has n components, okay? It's, it's an element of Euclidean n dimensional Euclidean space. Let's consider quadratic features involving the cross products between the, uh, the components. So there's x squared here, x1 squared here, 
is x2 squared and there's x1, x2, and x1, x3, and so on. All of these are features. There are, these are also features, the linear features, and there's also a constant offset that takes the approximation up and down according to the multiplying coefficient. And this architecture is like this, a linear combination of the features. Here are these quadratic features weighted with corresponding weights, the linear features weighted with uh, this Ri, and the one that's weighted with R0. And uh, the parameter vector is the composite of R0, the Ri's, and the Rij's. Of course, you can go into more complicated polynomial architectures, like uh, third order polynomials, fourth order, and so on. Poly these are involved features that are polynomials of arbitrary order, of whatever order is necessary to get a good approximation in the components of X1, Xn. There's a whole theorem here in American medical analysis that says that given enough polynomials, you can approximate just about anything that, that, that might be useful in practice. Okay, this is called the Weiss's approximation theorem, if I remember correctly. Um, there's also a more general architecture of the false polynomials. Instead of having features that are polynomials of the components X, you can have polynomials of features of X. In other words, introduce some features of X and then polynomially combine them to obtain more complicated features. Now that gets pretty powerful. And, uh, and in fact, uh, there's been a lot of work on features on, on architectures of this type. Although nowadays people tend to prefer to work with the neural networks rather than polynomial type of uh, approximation. Okay, now the polynomial and the piecewise constant architectures are very general. Okay? They apply to very, very broad classes of problems. Now, it may be possible to look at a particular problem and look at, uh, at features that are special, uh, that take advantage of, that depend on the special structure of the problem that you have. For example, in chess, in the pre-alpha zero period, the standard approximation architecture, cost approximation in chess, is what you see here. The chess position was fed into a position evaluator, the position evaluator extracted features. And these features were manually crafted. They are the type of features that a chess player looks at the board and can tell you right away what's important and what's not important. For example, the material balance, an important feature of a position, whether one side has more material than the other. The mobility of the pieces, how many places they can reach. Uh, safety of the king. Strategic features like open fives through which rooks can and the queen can 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 uh, uh, can penetrate the position of the opponent. All of these are features that chess players recognize, and in chess programs of the past, or even not so recent, not, not so distant past, these features were weighted manually. Okay, but just the handcrafting the weights uh, through trial and error. Try a certain set of features, then the program starts losing spectacularly, and you should scratch your head. What, what, is, what is the weight that's responsible for all this? Maybe, maybe it's this way, and then maybe we should change that weight. Trial and error over years, okay? We're talking about, about such programs have been around since, uh, since the 60s, I think. Uh, um, uh, however, in, uh, in more recently, there has been the success of alpha zero, and all of this has been replaced with a neural network or a combination of this and a neural network. This, this act, actually a lot of work that's going on in the chess these days. And uh, alpha zero is not, uh, there are a lot of challenges to alpha zero, uh, which uh, the parent company has prudently taken out of circulation. So you cannot play against alpha zero because it's, it's not publicly available. 
but there are there are sort of imitators of alpha zero, and their quality of play is just as good. And they involve combinations of this type of architecture and also a neural network architecture. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, here's another paradigm, Tetris. Yes, you have a question. When we are training the model, we need data set. So we are collecting the cost function using multi that we are doing. Uh, but uh, in the case of like infinite horizon problem, like how we design the cost? Uh, for example, like, uh, we don't have the transition to the model. A conditional probability. I don't understand what this refers to. Um, there's no conditional probability here. What, no, what, no. what are you referring to? Oh. Yeah, please, because I can't hear very well. Yeah, uh, uh, my question is like, how do you like design the cost? Uh, like, you need a data set to train the model. So, how you design that data set? Like, uh, means while you are collecting the samples. You are getting some cost values. You told that you run Monte Carlo and generate trajectories and take some of the like cost samples. So, uh, like in case of like if the problem is of infinite horizon, then you don't have like any place to stop. So, how you model that cost? Like that is my question. Uh, okay, with with chess, it's the collection of data is very complicated. It involves Monte Carlo research and. Uh, um, um, chess also, the way you have described it here, it involves hand crafting of, uh, of the weights. So there's no training really. Uh, so there's no data set that has been that's collected. There are some chess programs that, uh, that uh, use uh, uh, a training set from the grandmaster play. In other words, they form pairs of positions and moves that grandmasters have played in these positions. And they train on the play of grandmasters to make the architecture and the weights as close as possible to replicate the play of grandmasters. So, but that's that's done in a that has been done in a few chess computer chess programs. But not uh, certainly not all. Okay. So um, let me go into Tetris. Uh, Tetris uh, is another program that has been used extensively as a, uh, as a test bed. Uh, for 25 years uh, now, and uh, I'm sure, sure you're somewhat familiar with Tetris. It involves a certain board of the squares, and it involves uh, uh, falling shapes of several different types, straight lines, jagged uh, uh, objects, and so on. And the objects fall, and they stack up along these columns, and uh, if at all with the, is completed, then it's removed from the board and you score a point. The objective is to score as many points as possible up until the point where the top of one of the columns touches the top of the board, in which case the game stops. So now this is a stochastic game, which makes it uh, more difficult than chess, okay? Uh, and um, it, um, uh, it has a tremendously large state space. The number of positive positions is just completely astronomical. And, uh, and therefore, they cannot be, the problem cannot be solved exactly. It's a stochastic shortest path problem, mathematically speaking, but it cannot be solved exactly. Um, However, its cost function has been approximated using a linear feature-based architecture involving like 20 features or so. 
And I'll explain what the features are. Um, okay. Just eyeballing the game and getting some rudimentary understanding of it, it's clear that the height of the columns is an important feature, right? So let's say you have 10, 10 positions across. So there's 10 features right there, the 10 heights of the columns. And then the relative height of adjacent, the, the, the height differences between adjacent columns is also an important feature because if the upper, the top of the board is kind of jagged, then it's more difficult to, to fit floating objects within the holes. And okay, tennis players recognize that it's not a good idea to have very uneven top uh, boundary. So for a 10 position, it's another nine, 19. Now another feature that looks important is the number of holes inside the wall. Because holes are inaccessible, it's very hard to, to okay, they sort of cut off the bottom from the top. And uh, so you want to minimize the number of holes in the board. And uh, so that makes it, um, okay, the maximum height of the wall was another feature. So that brings us 21 features, plus the constant offset is 22 features. So you approximate a cost function that involves an astronomical number of uh, components into a 22 feature representation. That's a big game. And it turned out that over the years with various training methods, uh, it took decades to do that. Uh, people have been able to train this architecture sufficiently well so that it, it plays practically forever. You can show that no matter, you can show that the optimal policy here will actually, will actually terminate at some time with probability one. This was shown by some mathematician. And uh, however, good, well-trained uh, Tetris programs uh, with policy iteration, the approximate policy iteration uh, can, uh, uh, can score in the millions of uh, rows removed, okay, very high. In the beginning, start out with hundreds of rows, that's but gradually with improvements, uh, it's also motivated theoretical advances, um, the quality of these programs have improved. But the point I want to make here is that by using problem specific features, you can gain a lot. You can get pretty good architectures. Okay, so let me also mention another kind of architecture, um, how to construct complicated approximation architectures using simpler architectures. One way to do that is partition the state space into several subsets and construct a separate cost approximation in each subset. Depending on the character of the state space within each set of the partition, you tailor the approximation accordingly. And an interesting idea here is to generate this partition by using features. It's possible to have a regular partition, but that's not very good. It's important to have a partition that's sort of intelligent so that you don't have too many sets of partition. And one way to do this is to use features. You use in feature space, you use a regular partition, which induces an irregular partition in the state space. So in this way, uh, states with similar features are grouped together. States with similar features are grouped together. And, and this tends to help, but, uh, just if you think about it, it's helpful. And uh, we're gonna see an instance of this in the context of aggregation in the next lecture. Um, so, so that's the idea here and can take several different forms uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it can be very powerful in this particular context. Okay, so all of the preceding architectures I talked to you about, you have to select the features. You have to somehow uh, 
design the features, polynomial features, special features, features or deadlifts. You have to provide them. In some cases, you don't have uh, features or you don't have enough features to construct a powerful architecture. And that's where neural networks come in. Neural networks don't need features. They will construct features for you. And how does this happen? Well, look at this simple neural network involving a single linear layer, a single nonlinear layer, and two linear layers. What you have here is um, the state being approximated by this, the, the cost of the state being approximated by this neural network. And, uh, and uh, in this neural network, uh, the, it's very often useful to use pre-processing of the state to extract some features that you know already from the state and also to encode the state into something that the neural network can understand. So from X, you go to some vector Y sub X that's, that's closer to what the neural network does. And then you pass that through a linear layer that takes Y sub X, multiplies with a matrix, adds a certain vector, and produces another vector here at the output. And this output vector is fed into a bank of nonlinearities, single input, single output nonlinearities. And you get a vector of the same dimension as the one that you have inputted here. Now, this vector depends on x and depends also on the parameters of the linear layer. T here is involves the matrix of the linear layer plus B, the vector of the linear layer. So these are the parameters to tune here, okay, in the neural network. And what comes out here is weighted linearly with some other parameters to give you a cost function approximation that's linear in the features that come out at the output of the nonlinear. I know this is complicated, but perhaps some of you have seen this kind of picture before. This is the simplest neural network, involves a single nonlinear layer. Take the state. And uh, the neural network produces you a cost function approximation by this process here through a linear layer with parameters to be tuned, through a nonlinear layer, and then again a linear weighting with parameters to be tuned. So the parameters of this big contraption are these V's and the R's. Okay. And uh, so that's how you generate uh, the cost approximation. And you match this against training data, state cost pairs, and you try to tune the parameters so that what the neural network produces is close to your training set. Now, all of this is very nonlinear and horribly complicated, even though, even, even, even though this is only a single layer. So we'll come back to this, but uh, what we want to go into now is uh, the training of architectures, uh, natural optimization algorithms that we use to, to find the parameter sets. So let's take a break here. Are there any questions? Before we take a break, take a break for like ten minutes, and then we'll continue. Okay, so. Uh, we'll now discuss uh, the training of uh, architectures, both linear and nonlinear. Um, remember that what we try to do here is to uh, uh, is to first collect a, a training set, a set of state cost pairs, excess beta s. Beta s is the target cost at xs plus some noise, okay? It could, so it could be involved some noise. The methods don't change if this is so. And uh, uh, the 
the parameter vector is determined by trying to match the output of the architecture to the to the corresponding cost of the training pair. And uh, um, there are a number of cost functions for doing that. The most common one is least squares regression, whereby you try to minimize over the parameters the sum of the squared elements between the output of the architecture and the output of the training set. And uh, it's the sum over all over all um, over all training pairs. So this Q here could be very, very large. This functions seem relatively simple. They're not so simple to fully change tilde. They can be very complicated, but there's a very, very large number of them. Um, sometimes a quadratic regularization term is also added. The norm of the parameter vector times some gamma uh, scalar, positive scalar. Um, this is done for a number of reasons. One of these is to make this, this minimization a little bit better behave. This regularization term tends to have some stability to various algorithms that are used to its minimization. But there's another important reason, which has to do with the issue of overfitting, avoiding to make the output of the of the approximation of the approximation architecture very close to the data, too close to very close fit to the Data. This may have uh, uh, detrimental effects because then the architecture is sort of specialized with data that may not be do so well in approximating uh, in approximating the target function outside the data set. Okay, this is a well-known problem in uh, in machine learning, and uh, uh, we're going to discuss it a little later also in the context of deep neural networks. The the story has changed quite radically around the issue of overfitting, and the theory has been turned on its head in the last uh, few years, the last 10 years or so. So more on this later. Um, so this is our basic problem, and uh, can distinguish between linear architectures and nonlinear architectures. Remember, a linear architecture is one that uh, weighs, weighs uh, linearly the features. And if you plug this in here, then this problem becomes quadratic in R. And quadratic minimizations can be done in closed form. So for linear architectures, this problem can be solved in closed form. And here's the formula. Okay, to understand this formula, um, it's obtained by setting the derivative of the objective and, and to zero, setting the derivative to zero, and then collecting terms. And then the result is what you see here. And uh, remember now that phi sub x is a column vector, m-dimensional column vector. Phi sub x prime is the transpose, transpose of that, m-dimensional row vector. So this is an m by m matrix, square matrix. Uh, m can be large, so this can be gigantic. So that may be a problem. Uh, also, you have to add all those over all components of the data set. So this Q can also be very large. And then you have to invert that. Um, the matrix here may be singular in some, close to singular in, in, in some problems. Okay, the inversion itself may also be a difficult. So this involves a lot of computation and inversion of uh, gigantic, potentially gigantic, and potentially ill-conditioned matrices. So this may not work in practice. It may work for some problems, but not for others. Um, so if M is large and Q is large, uh, it may not be the best, in which case you, you don't try to take advantage of the linearity of the architecture. This is the same thing that you would do for nonlinear architecture which is to use gradient type methods for the most part. Okay, so let's go to this training issue, how to exploit the structure of the training problem, which is sum of squared terms of large number 
a large sum of square terms. How do we solve this problem efficiently? Now, what are the characteristics of this problem? It's possibly non-convex, because this is non-linear, with many local minima, a horribly complicated graph, the cost function. You don't have to go to large, uh, to large dimensions to see that. Even in just two or three dimensions, two or three ways, you can see that the graph of this function here is just horrible. As flat surfaces and dip, sharply dipping surfaces and a lot of local minima, and it's extremely complicated. It's remarkable that anything works on a cross function like that, but actually it does. The another characteristic of this, this square sum is that it has many terms. Q can be very large. So standard gradient methods and Newton-like methods that are the workhorses of uh, continuous optimization, they don't work. The reason is that to calculate the gradient of this cost function involves taking the gradient of all these components and the number of components can be very, very large. And uh, to do calculate the second derivatives is even worse. The second derivative that you need for Newton's is even worse. So the kind of uh, methods that have worked for neural networks and the related problems and these training problems are incremental methods that operate on a single term at a time at every iteration. And they have worked well enough for many problems and they are used universally. So the idea is instead of using all, dealing with all these terms in the sum simultaneously, you deal with them one at a time and this involves less computation. But how on earth would such a method work? Well, it turns out that there's interesting theory around methods like that. And we're going to discuss them now. Incremental optimization of sums, large sums of differentiable functions. I'm going to discuss it uh, in a more general context, not, not to clutter the, the slides with complicated uh, parametric approximation formulas. I'm going to discuss it in terms of this problem. Minimize f of y, where y is the optimization vector, and f of y is the sum of a number of components. Each fi is a differentiable scalar function of the n-dimensional vector y. In the context of parametric training, it is the parameter vector. Okay, now these methods were invented in the, in the 80s. They were understood in the 90s. Uh, and the research in this area continues. The context of neural networks these methods are called backpropagation. Um, to me, they're just incremental gradient methods, but if you want to call them backpropagation, that's fine, as long as we understand what we're talking about. Uh, here is the issue. The ordinary gradient method for minimizing cost functions, generic cost functions, F, works like you see here. It's an iterative method. And at the kth iteration, it has a vector yk and generates a new vector yk plus one by moving in the direction of the negative gradient. We calculate the gradient of f at yk multiplied with a constant uh, with, with some positive parameter, so the step size. Some kind, sometimes people call it the learning rate. Of neural so this gamma k tells you how much you ought to move in the direction of the negative gradient. And after you move, you obtain yk plus one. Now, this is a classical method. It's, it's been proposed by Cauchy, famous French mathematician in the 1700s. Okay? Uh, it's sort of a very fundamental method in optimization. And numerical optimization. And uh, however, when applied to our sum of components cost function, it takes this form here, this gradient of F 
is the sum of the gradients of the components. And the number of components may be very, very large. So there's an inefficiency here or a roadblock that we would aim to overcome by using an incremental version of that, whereby instead of calculating this gradient for all components at the case iteration, we just choose a random one. And then we iterate and move in the direction of negative gradient of that component only. So there's a day and night difference between this iteration and this iteration. This is much, much faster. On the other hand, it's not a great iteration. What the hell is it? I mean, at first sight, why do this work? And here is why it works. Um, this figure is uh, quite inside, insightful. It tells you a lot of the story. Um, we want to compare the ordinary and the incremental gradient methods for a particular example. In this example, the component functions are quadratic. Okay. Uh, y is motion. And ci and di are the parameters of the quadratic. So here is y, and here are the various components. Okay. And uh, uh, they have, uh, okay, their minimum is at zero, actually, because if you take y here to be the, the ratio of b, i, and c, i, then it's zero. So each one of those has a minimum that's at zero. And the minima of all of these components are lying some region, which I call capital R. Uh, y, i star, is the minimum of the i component function and the minimum minimizer is here and the maximum minimizer is here. So these are the minimized components, the minimum of the sum. The sum is like, is, is of course above zero, something like that. And its minimum lies somewhere within this region. So this is the region of the minima and the uh, Place where we want to go is somewhere in the middle. Now, suppose that uh, you start, you have an iteration where yk is, is to the right of this region, what they call the far out region, far out from the middle. Then the ordinary gradient method would calculate the gradients of all of the components and will move in that direction. Right now, the incremental gradient will just pick one component, maybe this one, maybe that one, maybe that one, and move in that direction. So, the incremental gradient method will do roughly the same thing as the regular gradient method at much lower cost in the far out region, it sort of goes in the right direction. Similarly, in the region to the left of this region here. Uh, it will do the right thing and will move towards where it needs to go at much less computational cost. However, once the method, the incremental method, gets inside here, which I call the region of confusion, the method gets confused because it could be here and it needs to go somewhere closer to the middle. But suppose that it takes, it chooses this component to iterate on, then it will go in the opposite direction. So it doesn't really know where to go. Sometimes it goes in the right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction, and it gets confused. However, in the initial stages where the starting point is in the far out region, it zooms in at much less computational cost. And then it has to play around. Now, uh, is it going to converge? Okay, there is theory that says that it will converge, provided the step size that you use is diminishing. So it requires diminishing step size for convergence. That's something that was clarified in the 90s and after that, a lot of people have looked into this issue of how do you choose the step size, the learning rate, how to guarantee convergence. So that's the picture here. 
when far from convergence, the incremental gradient is as fast as the ordinary gradient with one over M amount of work per iteration. Day and night uh, difference. However, when it's close to convergence, the incremental gradient method gets confused and requires a diminishing step size for convergence. But in neural network applications, in training applications, we don't care for extreme accuracy, really. We want to get near the ballpark for the most part. And then if we can do better than that, so much the better, but it's not critical. Okay, there are some other things about this example. It's very specialized because it's one dimension to begin with. So you have to think in a multi-dimensional case, you have to think of the far out region to be out in the periphery of this region of the minimum. But still the same idea applies. In the far out region, we move more or less in the right direction. Um, also, there may be functions that, uh, there may be the components may be like this, may not have minima, um, may, uh, may have um, maybe like these exponentials. But then again, there are examples. Your, your class notes has, exact, have, have, has examples that illustrates this phenomenon for more general examples than for more general situations than what is seen here in this, uh, in this figure. Okay, so this is the incremental gradient method, what's called in the neural network partners back propagation. This is the bread and butter type of method. And, uh, and this is the one that uh, has brought the neural network training into practice. Um, however, there are improvements, and the research still continues in this area. It's a class of method called aggregated incremental methods, it aims at accelerating the uh, standard method. And uh, it still evaluates the gradient of a single term of each iteration, but then it, it aggregates gradients, puts a lot of gradients together, the past gradients together, with the idea of getting an approximation to the true gradient that's more faithful than what you would get from a single component. Um, this method dates to the 2000s and has received quite a bit of attention and also it was a starting point for a lot of other developments. Um, there's a community that works very intensively with this, this methodology. It has theoretical and empirical support in software preference. Um, you will hear the name SGD in this, in this uh, area, stochastic gradient descent. Um, there's nothing stochastic about the methods that we have discussed in the previous, in the previous slides. However, stochastic gradient descent stems from another problem, which applies to the minimization of an expected value. W being a random variable, and so you have this function of the optimization variable y and the random variable w. Take the expected value of this. That's how you get f of y. Um, so now this SGD samples w at the k iteration gets a sample and then moves in the direction not of the expected value but rather the moves in the direction of the gradient corresponding to that sample okay so it looks like uh, if you think of expected value as being an weighted sum of components it looks like uh, like an incremental method um, in particular, the incremental gradient method with random index selection uh, is the same as the stochastic gradient method. And the idea is to convert the sum to an expected value. You start with a sum, you can convert to an expected value for i's random distribution, then you get this method here. SGD and incremental gradient method are very closely connected, and one is a special case with the other. Okay, there are a number of issues here. How do you pick the step size? Usually, particularly in the region of confusion, a diminishing step size is uh, used uh, that uh, goes down at this rate here. Um, 
Some methods are ambitious and try to detect the intuition of confusion and reduce the step size accordingly. Keep it high up until the method gets wobbly and oscillatory, and then they 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 reduce the step size. Um, then, okay, how do you pick the how do you pick the components on which to iterate? Remember that M components of the cost function, how do you pick the one that to iterate on? Well, one possibility is to use a cyclic order. You have a certain fixed order of the components, you go from the first to the last, then back to the first, and so on. It is also possible to use randomization, there are also other schemes. Um, and uh, so there are deterministic orders, randomized orders, and so on. Uh, usually, these two are the ones that uh, that uh, you find the people using, but there are also other possibilities. Uh, when you're using a randomized selection of component, it's important that the randomization is according to a uniform distribution, because otherwise some components may be weighted differently than, than others. Diagonal scaling is advocated quite a bit for good reason. Now here, you basically multiply the gradient with some diagonal matrix. And this is roughly equivalent to using a different step size for each component of Y. And uh, okay, there are ways to select the diagonal components. There are also more ambitious alternative methods, which I discussed in your class notes uh, to, to a limited extent, uh, relating to Newton's method, something called the extended Kalman filter. Uh, and uh, there are also, there's, there's a lot of a lot of proposals in this day. Sometimes a proposal that specialized a particular type of problem. Okay, so that's all I I I I want to go that's as much as I want to get into this issue. Are there any questions? Okay, now let's return to neural networks. How does all this apply to neural networks? Remember the figure I gave earlier, the neural network approximation at the input gets a state, the state gets encoded into something with the name of all features that goes through a linear layer and then through a nonlinear layer. At the exit of the nonlinear layer, there's a, there's a, a set of, um, uh, it's a vector, uh, that we view a vector as a factor of features depends on x, it also depends on the parameter of the linear layer, and there's also additional linear weighting here. So we have a given training set of state cost pairs, and uh, we want to obtain the parameters of the neural network, which is the matrix A, the ve vector B, and the vector R. And we do this by solving a least squares training problem, specialized least square training problem that, that I had in my earlier slides, specialized to the neural network. Okay. So we have to minimize the sum of the squared errors between data and the output of uh, the, the output and, and the cost approximation. So this is the inner product that you see here for RL, the components of R, and the output of the nonlinearities. This sigma represents the nonlinearity. So what goes into each nonlinearity is the Lth component of this vector here. It's transformed nonlinear with this sigma function, and it's weighted linearly with the with the parameters of the last linear layer. And the error between this and the corresponding cost of the data set is squared and it's minimized, the sum of all those errors, squared errors, is minimized over A, B, and R. It seems horrible. But um, uh, it turns out that the gradient of each component can be calculated very efficiently by going backwards using this back propagation, which uh, 
if you are a person not in the you recognize it simply as a the chain rule. The chain rule in the, of calculus is used to calculate a gradient. Chain rule calculates gradients of component of composite functions. So going backwards is a composition function here. If you use the chain rule backwards, you're going to get the gradient of a component. So it can be it can be implemented with the, the in software quite easily. Now, here's a thing about neural networks that's important. They have a universal approximation property. Suppose that you solve this problem, then the solution can approximate any target function, any meaning, meaning any practically arising target function, like some continuity or piecewise continuity problems, can approximate arbitrarily well with sufficiently large network size. In other words, if you increase the size, the number of these nonlinear units, and the size of this matrix here, you can get arbitrarily close to any target function with, uh, with uh, of course, with a large data, large enough data set also. So this is the universal approximation property. It's reassuring, but, uh, but in practice, practical terms, you need uh, to deal with all, a lot of the other issues. Now, what's interesting about the universal approximation property is that it is valid for even the smallest uh, neural network. It doesn't have to be big. Only the number of parameters have to be large, but the number of layers can be as little as one. Okay. As a result, in the early days of neural networks, people did not look to, to add more layers. They use one layer or two layers, three layers at most. Now, in the recent times, people have discovered deep neural networks. Well, before we go to deep neural networks that involve many layers, let me discuss also nonlinearities a bit there. Okay, remember, these are single input, single output nonlinearities. The most uh, common nonlinearity is the so called ReLU, rectified linear unit, which is this function here. Is the maximum function between zero and psi. So for positive values of psi, it's linear, and for negative values of psi, it is, it is zero. And uh, this expression here as a function of psi smooths out the corner, makes it differential. We need differentiability because we're using gradients, right? We can't calculate the gradients of, of non, non differentiable functions. So we smooth it out. And it turns out that this is adequate for the universal approximation problem. It's also very simple. In the old days, people were using this sigmoidal units, so called hyperbolic tangent function that sort of flattens out as, uh, as, uh, uh, as psi increases or decreases. And uh, another one is logistic function, which is what you see here again. The key thing is that it flattens out on both sides. Uh, the key characteristic, it's not essential, but, 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 but it's the, the key characteristic. Here you can use the same property by, by putting together, by combining some of these values to induce behavior like this. Okay, nowadays people use values. Uh, in the older days, values were not used, but uh, whether it seems that there are some advantages. So simplicity is one of them for using this type of neural network. Okay, so now let's get to deep neural networks. Um, like I said, in the older days, uh, people were satisfied with just two layers, two, two nonlinear, two layers of nonlinearities or three layers of nonlinearities at most. Um, then, around the, the, the end of the 90s, uh, people suspected that 
that by making rich by using richer neural networks, they, they, they would get some advantage. There were some computational studies, the phenomenon was not understood, and also it was not paying any attention to it. It was around 2000, people stopped being interested in neural networks. It was a so called winter of AI. Every so often there's a winter of AI. I think we probably have seen the last winter of AI after chat GPT. I think AI has taken off. Good. Uh, but there were these periods where people were saying that, okay, all this AI stuff is crazy. I don't see any benefit. That, you know, it's flaky. And, uh, and so all of a sudden people stopped working on AI. And that was one of those periods. And then some brave souls continued to work on, 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 net, on neural networks. And in some applications, some key applications involving image processing, speech processing, these deep neural networks, which are simply many layers, many layers, lots of parameters, a gigantic number of parameters, they started producing some results that were very substantially better than what was produced with shallow neural networks. So there was a frenzy of research after that to figure out why are these neural networks better uh, in various applications. After all, they involve a very, very large number of parameters. Often the number of parameters, the linear layer parameters uh, are in total much larger than the number of data points. Um, so the recent, recent research has is converging in suggesting that it's over parameterization that's the main reason why these deep neural networks work better. What do we mean by over parameterization? A lots of parameters, as exemplified by deep neural networks. Lots of parameters, many more parameters than data points. So the data points may be, maybe if you have a data set of, well, let's say, 100 million data points, put in there a few billion. <laughs> Of parameters and uh, with a strong enough computer uh, and a deep neural network that may work. And indeed, theory has shown that uh, this is true in some sense. Okay, let me get a little bit more specific here. Uh, generally speaking, the critical parameters is R, the number of parameters over the number of data points. In the old days, if this R was close to one, that was called overparameterization, which means that you have roughly as many data points as you have parameters. So when you do the training, the parameters are chosen to fit the data. And so you get an approximation architecture that fits very well the data, but does not do very well outside the data. So that was a fundamental problem and the drive the driver in the implementation of neural networks. You got to avoid overparameterization. So it was the number, so the, the number of data points was taken to be large relative to the number of parameters. And also in the training, there was this quadratic regularization term uh, added to steer the method away from fitting the data very closely. Now, in deep neural networks, R is greater than one, often substantially greater than one. Many more parameters than data points. And it turns out that the problem of overparameterization, doing very well on the given data set and doing poorly outside the data set is overcome. Basically, there's a lot of freedom of fitting the data with parameters. There are many more parameters than data. So you can fit the data exactly, but also you can, you can have additional freedom to play around the parameters. And so it turns out that, that in practice, the problem with overparameterization can be overcome. So this, you'll often see in this, in the literature, a figure where R, the ratio is plotted and the critical point is R equals to one. And the performance of the neural network is 
and the performance of the neural network is good up to the point where R gets close to one. After R gets larger than one, the neural network performance gets better. That's what deep neural networks do, basically. That's why they work better. So the alpha zero deep neural network uses a lot. It's a very big, really very big. Uh, Chat GPT, I understand, has uh, also a big uh, neural network. I suspect that it is uh, larger than the number of uh, data points, although I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> number of data points is so enormous. But, okay, the details of Chat GPT are not known, but it involves a deep neural network, a gigantic neural network. It's 175 billion parameters. 175 billion? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. for GPT 3. It's a separate. Yeah. So imagine a gradient method. It would have 175 billion components. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 175 billion. How about the number of data points? Well, it's kind of interesting. Just, uh, well, just natural language, like from the web, I suppose, like, like what chat you get the time to play it right off of it. We don't know, but the largest publicly available data set on natural language is the file, which is about 800 gigabytes of text. That's so, okay. terabytes of. Okay, so that's so less than, uh, than the, the billion that the. Okay. 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 We can't yeah. have a way to quantify how much data they have. Yeah, I'm not sure how the training is done, but I'd be interested to find it. Okay, so it's, a, it's amazing. It's, neural networks have been around in, uh, uh, for a long time, and uh, they have been researched extensively. And now, with deep neural network, the theory has been brought to its head. Before it was saying, don't over parameterize, for God's sake. Now they're saying, by <laughs> God's sake, over parameterize is good for you. Okay. So, um, so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, an interesting thing that has happened in this area. And there's a lot of uh, research going on, still going on, and there has been recent research. We're talking about just the last few years. It's phenomenal, we've understood only the last five years or so, uh, maybe a little more. Um, So, okay, we reached the end of this lecture. Are there any questions? Okay, well, we have one more lecture to go. It's going to be again on offline training, doing value and policy narration using neural networks, and also an introduction to aggregation, aggregation which is a different type of gradient based. Uh, that propagation type of method. Use a different framework, but it's still an offline training method. So it's relevant to our, to our subject. Okay.